Hi, Lisa. Thank you for coming. This morning, I guess it's good morning is where you are. Are you there? Can you hear me? Madam Lisa, is it Anise or Anis? Oh, can I? Okay. I think you have to unmute yourself. I don't have anyone muted. Let me see what. Uh, Prince Andrew, do you uh, do you have that access? I don't see. Let me look over here on your participants. Uh, it, it's just been done. I don't know how, by whom, but <laughs> okay. I, when I tried to chime in, I got this big fat notice that the host <laughs> had not unmuted anybody. So here okay. I am. Okay. Okay. Good. 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 Okay. So we got that done. Well, okay. welcome. Welcome. It is. Now, Tuesdays is my early day for meetings. I had one at 5.30 this morning. So. Oh, my. Which one was that? Um, well, that's that's the one between um, uh, Lloyd, Mark Rosangi, myself, and the heads of uh, larger European permaculture groups that have actually been organizing a lot of the groups on the ground in Africa. Um, I thought it would be best uh, when Lloyd suggested we come up with a database. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it would be best to take it from the top. Oh, nice. And, and see about getting these individuals to uh, release their list of people on the ground, um, so to speak. But that's going to take conversation. So, mm -hmm. and so, what's the gist of the project? So, when you say horticulture, what are they doing? Um, well, uh, they are the founders of the permaculture movement that's been going on um, pretty much worldwide, and they come from a number of different locations. Um, some of them are associated with uh, university studies. Um, I do know of one group here on the peninsula in California, um, about 25 miles south of me, um, that's been conducting studies on uh, biochar, its uses and production. Mm -hmm. um, getting in contact with these groups, we get to find out what, what, what uh, the source of their science is um, and uh, basically what they have uh, working on the ground. Um, I do have a lot of contacts, but it's mostly uh, people who are on the ground that I've spoken with over the years. Um, getting to the ones at the top that have started all these different groups, um, I think would be just a little more efficient. And of course, we can talk about uh, policies that they've used that uh, we can adopt um, or, or change as needed but um, it's just that search for more partners in this effort. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I have, I think, do I have, I have your email. I don't know if I have your phone number, maybe to talk more about it. I'm gradually getting familiar with some of these different areas. There are two people, why are they two? Cause I didn't see them pop up. Hold on a second here. We want to get, uh, oh, we have Manly, that's good. I just gave you my uh, WhatsApp. Um, is that your home number as well? Yes, it's also my uh, home number. Okay, let me put that in. And um, let's see. Mm -hmm. There you are. Oh, guess what? I have it. <laughs> I had it. I guess I must have gotten it out of, uh, hold on, let me double check it. Yeah. Yep, 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 yep. I must have gotten it off of WhatsApp. So it's okay if I give you a call and we can, I can get, just trying to get myself uh, up to speed on some of the terminology. Um, I kind of like to stay in my lane, but I'm finding these days that my lane intersects or uh, connects with a lot of other areas. So it's Absolutely. good to be familiar with them. Absolutely. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Grand Rising. Well, it's 11 o'clock here, so not quite that yeah, early. That, yeah, it's 10, 10 here, so you're an hour. Well, you're or like on Eastern, yeah, on Eastern time because you're right mm -hmm. there by, by Michigan. Well, 
You're in Toronto. Uh huh. Okay. Lake Ontario, Great Lakes. North American Great Lakes, now I like to say. <laughs> we used to go I to suppose. Toronto every every August, the first uh, weekend in August. But... Hello, Manly. This is my second time seeing seeing your name. Is uh, excited about the possibilities with the visualization project that both you and Lloyd are working on. How are you? Where are you located? Hello, I am uh, in Martinique, French Caribbean. French Caribbean? Yes, Martinique. Martinique, okay, very good. Our guest today yeah. was, I think that's her birth, well, not, I don't think that's the, the country. She'll talk about it later, but she has a lot of good information. And then I see uh, Dr. Rusley. Welcome, welcome. And I think we're going to- Hello, uh, everybody. How is it going? Okay. Good, good. Thank you. So, I'm we have, this is a day, I, uh, um, I multitask, multitask with grandchildren <laughs> and uh -huh. hybrid, school, hybrid schools and those kinds of things. So we do have a presentation today. I'm going to do the first 30 minutes of inspiration and a little bit of, let's see, my uh, special guest comes on at 1030 because they have another class. And, uh, but I have plenty, as you well, you can imagine, to, to uh, mm -hmm. go over. But, but it's mostly inspiration, but it also has some content to it that I'm hoping that you all will, will glean from it because uh, it does connect. It's, like I say, I'm finding with some of the other things we've talked about. So I may even give a little quiz if she's not here yet. Okay, so Prince Andrew, you can begin to uh, you can begin the recording and I will begin sharing. Very well, just a moment, please. Okay. And for everybody, as you well know, I can't see anybody once I put this screen up. So, <laughs> so just know I'm. Uh, if you have a concern, if it's not uh, the sound is not loud enough, or so something is going on, just please let me know. So, good morning, everyone. And welcome to our second uh, Unity Health Network meeting. We welcome you. I am Prophet Anyanwu Cox, registered nurse. I'm registered in the state of Missouri. I keep my license up because I just decided that they would bury me with it since it took so much to get it. But I also have my master's in education, which is te uh, uh, educational technology is what it is specifically, or instructional technology, they called it at, in, in that time. Um, I am a co community health educator and student community elder, national and local holistic practitioner, wellness coach, ordained minister, and, and over the years have touched a lot of different areas. The um, Unity Health Net Network uh, it's a global health and health strategy subgroup of the Global Unity Network as managed by the CSF Development Group. It's focused on healthcare learning delivered through a virtual collaborative education and training platform. And it's dedicated to the optimal health and wellness and mind, body, and spirit of all humanity and all divine creation. We invite you we go back. We invite you. Oh my goodness, come on. We invite you today to take a day to heal from the lies you've been told and the ones you've told yourself. That is a quote from Dr. Maya Angelou. And we like to begin these sessions with the African drum. This is specifically the talking drum, which According to some researchers, actually, if a skilled player was, was utilizing it, could back in the uh, traditional times, it could actually mimic language.
And before I move on to the next slide, you'll notice the logo for this particular group. We have um, the Unity Health Network. Uh, the symbol has Ubuntu, which means I am because we are, and I am therefore we are. It has also, according to my understanding from our one of our administrators and founder, Mr. Lloyd Hefty, and he can pronounce it obviously better than I can, an eagle and a condor, I believe, one from the South, one representing the North, coming together. Also, we have, let me hide my little bar up here. We have the symbol for the Sustainable Development Goal. Hold on a second. Good health and wellness, which is number three. As we move forward. And we like to begin with a quote from an ancestor and one of my favorite uh, ancestors, community ancestors is Harriet Tubman, who has many wonderful quotes. A very incredible woman who was hit in the head with an iron at a young age, was in a coma, I understand, for several months. I had narcolepsy as a result of it where she would fall out and not even know where she was at for a period of time. No one would know when she would fall out. They didn't even know when she would come to once she fell out. But somehow she managed to get quite a few people from the South to the North without ever getting caught because during her time of being out cold on the ground, she would usually have a vision of some kind that would tell her the correct direction to go. But her quote for today is, every great dream begins with a dreamer. Always remember, you have within you the strength, the patience, and the passion to reach for the stars and to change the world. So our inspiration today comes from Miss Akila. This is actually based on a true story. I just have a couple clips from it. I invite you to, if you have the time, you know, to get the movie, you can get it. Uh, I'm trying to have the same. You can actually get it on uh, YouTube or probably, I don't know whether the station you might, but anyway, so this is just a couple clips just to, uh, okay, this person has tried to get in three times. After this, I'll just wait until I'm at the end or someone that's a co-host can perhaps uh, also let uh, others in. Yes, you can proceed. We'll take care of that. C-R-A-Q-U-E-L. -E hey, yo, so why y'all punking out on the spelling bee, huh? What you afraid of all the suburbia kids now? No. Hey! So how you spell all these words anyway? I study them. What that mean? Where they go my ride? Hey, what up, Derek T? What up, Terrence? Who that? Ain't nobody, just my little sister. What up, little thing? Been seeing you on TV. Trying to win some big contests, huh? Answer the man. You know, I won something once, fifth grade. Wrote a poem. Even got myself a blue ribbon, too. <laughs> yeah, that's good. You wrote yourself a poem. Shut up, dog. What you think rap is? Stand your hand. Ain't nothing. Just some stupid word. Oh, you helping her? Nah, man. I'm chilling with you, right? Nah, man. Stay here and help your sis. Why? Because I say so. Let's break out. Man. Dirty. What's up? I want to read your poem. After you win the contest. Let's go, man. You ain't got to help me if you don't want to. Enfranchisement? You mean enfranchisement? Hey, whatever. Can you spell it? Fifty thousand coaches. E N F R. Fifty thousand coaches. No more sleeping in bed. No more back to thinking. Time for thinking ahead. The 
world has changed so very much from what it used to be. And Terry Goat Town. There's so what? much. That right there. At Terry Goat. Maybe you shouldn't show me the cards. Uh oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, 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 oh. Wake up, all the teachers. Time to teach a new way. Maybe then they'll listen to what you have to say. They're the ones who's coming up, and the world is in their hands. When you teach the children to jump the very best they can. on that, that word? I think we've got some pretty nervous kids up there. Effleurage or effleurage? E-F-F-L-E-U-R-A-G-E. -E. Effleurage. That's correct. I'm telling you, this is just like watching two-star tennis players at the net, the turning volleys. I mean, these kids are incredible. Lanyap. L-A-G-N-I-A-P-P-E. Lanyap. Thompson. Could you use it in a sentence, please? Is that a verb? Ophelimity. Politician. That's correct. Sophrosity. Parisian. Is that Greek? Was that Latin? What's the language of wardrobe? Lyophilize. Zardoin. Fabrici. Cracula. That's correct. These kids are chewing through these super tough words like they were breakfast cereal. You know, they could actually go the distance, and most people consider that unthinkable. We are now 13 words into the championship level. If you make it through the remaining 12 words, you'll be co-champions. That's never happened before. Vinegaroon. Ecdesis. Conchitato. Pierre. That's correct. Dylan and Aquila are trying to stage a miracle here. And to make it to the finish line, they need each other to succeed. E-R. A-Z. A D I A N. Shahrazadian. That's correct. L O G I C A L. Polynological. That's correct. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are down to the final two championship words. One or both of our spellers will walk away with the first place trophy. Dylan, you're up. Logaria. May I have the definition, please? Logaria is excessive and often incoherent talkativeness. Logaria. L O G O R R H E A Logaria. Congratulations, Dylan. You've won the script. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated for Aquila's turn. Pulchritude. Pulchritude. It's derived from the Latin word pulchere meaning beautiful, isn't it? That's correct. P. U. L. C. H. R. I. T. U. D. E. Pulchritude. Congratulations, Akila. Everything feels right where you don't have to worry about tomorrow or yesterday, but you feel safe and know you're doing the best you can.
There's a word for that feeling. It's called love. L-O-V-E. And it's what I feel for all my family and all my coaches in my neighborhood, where I come from, where I learned how to spell. All righty then. So let's see, we have about 10 minutes before our guest should arrive. So I have a couple more things to show, but I thought I'd stop for a few minutes and just get to uh, open up the uh, floor for comments on the, on the videos. What did you see? How does it fit? Does any of it fit with the work that we're doing, whether in health or any of the other aspects of the Unity Global Network? I want to get some feedback. Lloyd, I see you're unmuted. Yeah, so I, I, what I, what I was thinking actually during watching those clips was how important it was to have the music to set the mood for how you feel as you watch uh, something like that. And, and uh, if that music wasn't there, how different it would be in terms of the emotions of, the, of the, what has been presented in terms of that film. Uh, so I think that, that highlights how important culture is in terms of, of, uh, of uh, telling these stories. Uh, and that, this is, I think, what, what film has done, what Hollywood has done, what even Bollywood has done. And so I think that uh, that essence of, of uh, setting the, the um, emotions uh, through not just the words, but also the music that, was, that accompanies it. I think that's, that's something I wanted to just highlight is really very important. I think that's a good point. I, I uh, observed that at one point I start turning the sound down on movies like Jaws. <laughs> You know, to see what happens when you turn this, it's just amazing the, the effects of music. That is so true. Anyone else? The clips, what you saw? Yeah, I was wondering, um, I noticed the caption is in Indonesian. Oh, is it? I didn't know that. I, I tried to find one without it, but I thought, hey, the Global Unity Net, somebody should know what it's, what did it say? Was it keeping with the words? Because I don't know what it's uh, saying. Yeah, it was in Indonesian. I was able to see, I was surprised. Wow. That's good to know. That's isn't that something? And we yeah. happen to have someone who understood it on the call. That is really cool. What were your thoughts about the clips? Anything that jump out at, at you or anyone? Yeah, I think so. The one I was trying to capture with that uh, drum beat is the the spirit. The symbol always there. Uh, how how is that? Uh, being created from that music, kind of mystery to me. Mm -hmm. in, in terms of the clip itself as well, the message of the clip, what I, what I felt as well was, uh, from what was shown was, was the, important, uh, the importance of the community. And I think that was what was related when she was, the, the girl was reading that last word and showing the faces of all the people uh, relating those faces to her experiences with them and how in, uh, important community is uh, in, in allowing uh, and encouraging people to succeed because uh, mm -hmm. they don't succeed, they don't succeed alone. Right. That's, that's a very powerful message there in that, in that film as well. 
Yes, yeah, that that was. Uh, and if you get a chance to watch the entire movie, because you notice that uh, who were the players, they were not just the scholars. She had a scholar, but she had drug dealers and the grocery person. And uh, uh, I thought that was pretty, pretty profound that that uh, as we look at our communities, whether it's uh, urban or rural or whatever, that somehow they all came together around one cause, which wound up being her. That's, that was a really good, good piece. Mm -hmm. No, I think that that really stresses the point that there there are people important in our lives, no matter how, uh, where, what sort of um, official position they are in mm -hmm. that influence us. Um, so they may be our teachers, they may be, that may be their role as a career, uh, but there are teachers in our lives that are not, uh, don't have that title, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yet still are influential and, and teach us things. And I think that's that comes back to, again, the concept of Ubuntu. Um, Ubuntu. It's about all of us, uh, mm -hmm. and the interactions we have every day uh, between us, among us. That's so true. Very, very good. Uh, Lisa and Manly, anything that, that jumped out at you? Uh, I think that was just amazing. I saw the movie when I was a little girl and I was really, really emotive. But that's really great. And uh, actually, I see the connection with uh, how a dream can, can lift up uh, other people. All the fact that you are fighting for what you want, for what you uh, for, for a dream can actually inspire and allow other people to mobilize their own energy to mm -hmm. also transcend themselves and achieve who they are, all who they are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was really amazing. That was a, a pleasant surprise this morning. <laughs> <laughs> so you've seen it before, huh? Yeah, that's amazing. That was uh, 15 or maybe more years uh, earlier, yes. and that's amazing because I remember that I had the same calling and the same um, the same uh, feeling, the same emotion, and that created the same stuff, the stuff to say you just have to, to, to fight for what you want and you can achieve it. You can actually do it if you dream big enough. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And, and, they, and the people, the, whether it was the, uh, uh, the uh, drug dealer or whatever he was, the gang banger, something in him, he had written a poem. So her, her desires brought him back to a time that he had long forgotten. So that was, exactly. that was really a good piece. Exactly. Reconnecting to, the, to, to, to your own essence. And I think mm -hmm. that's when people realize their dreams, that reactivates mm -hmm. the memory of your own dreams within, and mm -hmm. that gives you an example of someone who did it. Consequently, you said, okay, I can do it also. And mm -hmm. if the person is living the dream is in love, as Akila said, this dream is going to propagate as lies propagates from heart to heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Some of the girls that started helping her used to beat her up. You remember that part? <laughs> no, I don't remember that part. Yeah, they were they would ridicule I, her and, movie. and I, yeah, watch <laughs> the movie again. I'm gonna watch again too. But but there are people who were her enemies, so to speak, her dream, her vision, they became her coaches, they were transformed. Awesome. So they, yeah. And I see Lisa had and our guest is here, we're just uh, wrapping this up. Uh, uh, Elsie, around the movie, I just showed some clips on Akila the Bee, uh, not Akila the Bee, Akila and the Bee. But uh, Lisa, you had to unmute it. Uh, well, what I found here was the wonderful transformation that occurs when many individuals uh, work on a goal, even if it's for just one individual. And um, I, as you said, the transformative property that it has. Uh, for even those who feel like they have nothing to contribute, they yes. find out, yes, they can. Mm -hmm. 
Everyone, and that's something for those of us who may have some other higher education or more economics to know that everyone, everyone, even a guy looked like he was maybe not homeless, but you know, not in the best of economics that 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 helped her. That that was uh, very very significant. Her dad, by the way, uh, and I don't want to give the whole story away in case you watch, but her dad had been shot on his way from from uh, work one day, so she had lost her dad. She had come from a difficult situation, did not want to do it. They had to kind of push her into it, and uh, but anyway, everybody won in the process. I, I was thinking about the uh, pilot projects. That, so for the benefit of Dr. Rusley, what I also saw was in terms of even poverty, something I think I mentioned on one of the other meetings, that it's good to get the, uh, even with the sports piece of it, because um, what was she doing? What was she doing that gave her exercise? Do you remember what was she doing? She was skipping rope. Exactly. And so ropes are pretty cheap. So while we're waiting for the big bucks, my, I'm saying send out some jump ropes and some hula hoops. I saw hula hoops in a Dollar Tree last week. They were $1. And so the jump ropes, you didn't see that there's another clip where she cannot remember. She uses rhythm. You would like this, uh, Lisa, that she would tap the side of her thigh and count with her fingers. And that's how she would keep up with the words. But one day that didn't work. Her finger tapping didn't work. And so she actually literally on the stage start uh, mimicking jumping rope because that's another way she learned each word. And it, it, it does something. I don't know the science behind entrainment with the brain that did something for her so that that's how she got to one level because she could only get the word spelled by, by mimicking jump roping. Well, uh, no, the studies have shown that uh, people who are downloading onto their brains a huge amount of information um, when rhythm and motion are used, um, they actually increase uh, retaining. Uh, so the, you can down and sort an awful lot more if you use um, rhythm in your voice, in your step, in your actions. So this demonstrates how simple, because she's not in a class, she's not in dancing, she's not in a sport, she just jumps rope. She started the jumping rope and then her friends kept her up, but that gave her something that was doable, a rope, a clothes. We used to have a clothesline. It wasn't one with the fancy uh, ends on it. It was just a jump, you know, just something. We even used rubber bands at one point when we were growing up. I don't know if you ever did that, Lisa. We used rubber bands. We used whatever we could find. So just to say that in the rural areas, in the poorest of the poor, can we get a rope? And the other thing um, is the fact she's doing her spelling. So even though she's going to school, those who are just telling her to repeat, all she's doing is repeating words and spelling the words that there's something that can be taught, even if they're not uh, with electronics, a lot of the things that we think of. I didn't see she did some computer stuff. So just let's remember that some simple things that may actually work to help with uh, exercise, energy, and training the brain, transformation. So I guess this year I'm gonna do one quick video and then I'm going to bring on my guest, special guest, and very happy to have her. We, uh, I'll tell you more about her in a second, but let me do, welcome Elsie. I'm going to do um, one quick video for the benefit of the cause here, let's see. Can you hear me, Elsie? There? I can, good afternoon. Good afternoon. So I'm going to start one video really quick and then I'm gonna bring you on, okay? That's fine. Okay. The United Nations is an organization with goals of peace and sustainable development around the world. Their mission is huge, but we're breaking it down in two minutes. 17 sustainable development goals. Let's get to them, because the more you know, look, in some corners of the world today, people are living on a dollar a day. Hey, that's not how it ought to be. So go one, eliminate poverty, and go two, Root out hunger across the globe There's 800 million people hungry if you wanna know Number three is health and well-being 
and getting people the health care that they need in. Learning in school or the heart of go for. Education opens up minds and doors. Goal number five is empower girls and women so they can have the same rights that men are given. Number six, people need water that's clean. Poor sanitation can't spread disease. Carbon free energy is goal number seven. And how to achieve it is a question that's pressing. But if we put our minds together and work hard, we can find a solution, I'm guessing. 17 sustainable development goals to improve life all around the globe. Protecting human health and the environment. Whatever bad we make, we gon' have to lie in it. 17 sustainable development goals to improve life all around the globe. Protecting human health and the environment. Whatever bad we make, we gon' have to lie in it. Now imagine that you work all day for no pay. Economic growth and decent workers go eight. Goal number nine is to foster innovation in infrastructure and industrialization. Goal number 10, inequality reduction. 11 is sustainable city construction. 12, well, that's sustainable consumption. So what we use matches up with production. Goal 13 calls for urgent action to combat climate change because we know what's happening. 14, protect life under seas. 15, protect life on land. Goal 16 is for peace and justice all over the planet. They're in high demand And the final goal Number 17 is the critical factor The heart of the machine It's the strength in the way We achieve these goals Of sustainable development Around the globe Yo. 17 sustainable development goals To improve life all around the globe Protecting human health and the environment Whatever bad we make We gon' have to lie in it 17 sustainable development goals To improve life all around the globe Protecting human health and the environment. Whatever bed we make, we gon' have to lie in it. Whatever bed we make, we're going to have to lie in it. So we take that reality to heart. And these, of course, are the sustainable development goals in chart form. And uh, you can familiarize yourself with that, those. So but for purposes of today and our uh, training, our meeting today, we want to welcome Miss Elsie Gale from the UK, all the way from the UK. She's an RN and a midwife, and she's obviously specialized in maternal child health. She focuses on delivering culturally safe maternity care. Her model is dedicated to ameliorate, ameliorating the historical roots of inequities and in service provision provision, obstetric violence, and the poor outcomes for disadvantaged mothers and babies, especially those of African descent. She initiated midwifery conversations to support a wide network of clinicians, students, and interested others in the birth world. It facilitates learning, updating clinical and regulatory practices. In 2016, she presented maternal and baby more Mortality, morbidity findings to the United Nations Committee for Elimination of Racial Discrimination, also called CERD, in Geneva, alongside the Global African Congress UK, where she now occupies the position of Honorable Elder and Secretary of that committee. She also serves as scribe for the Education and Outreach Committee, a subcommittee rather, of the International Working Group uh, on the permanent form of people of African descent, which uh, we actually served together on. And she has so graciously uh, uh, agreed to serve on the uh, uh, advisory board for the I Am Amare pilot project. So we are so grateful to be able to work with her in that capacity as well as other capacities. So we are in this particular um, session today. We, as I mentioned before, uh, sustainable goal number three, of health and well being, of course, is a part of the uh, Unity Health Network uh, node anyway, but we're also today focusing on women and girls, quality education, uh, partnerships, as well as equality. I think it's what that says, number 10. So I'll turn it over to you, Elsie, and what I'm going to do is come out of this for a second in order to pull up your slides. Oh, shoot. Did I leave? So, while you're doing that, <laughs> let okay. me just say good afternoon to everyone. Good morning or good evening, wherever you are. And thank you very much, Prophet, for 
inviting me to share my work with this esteemed group. Um, if you if you um, allow me to share screen. Okay, do you want to share the screen? You can share it. Let me, let me ask this, uh, uh, something I had not done. Uh, we want to get uh, Elsie on the floor. Can everyone just real quickly give your name and just one sentence or two or three words because we don't want to belabor the time. Can you just so she'll know she had who her audience is right now? Can we do that? Certainly. Um, I'm Lisa E. Sutton. I'm a member of the International Dance Council Division of UNESCO. Um, we're working to get this project in front of the main body of UNESCO uh, for their support and protection. Thank you. I'm Andrew Williams, Jr. I'm technically the overall host of this platform, so I welcome you here. I'm also the <clears throat> chairperson and founder of the Ad Hoc International Advisory Board of Goodwill Ambassadors, uh, through which Lloyd Helberty initiated these UNITINET events. So I'm Again, very pleased to be here and support your activities in any way I can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, my name is Lloyd Alperty. Uh, so I am uh, working with a small team here in Toronto, where I am in Canada, um, along with uh, our colleagues in Africa, in particular, uh, a gentleman by the name of uh, Carlos Richard Sanco, who uh, is in Sierra Leone, one of the least developed countries uh in not just in africa but in the world um who is uh we're together building this what we call unit global unity network um where uh the unity health network uh, that uh prophet cox is now uh hosting is one of the nodes of this network uh, so we have a vast network it's all right now on social media um but we do plan to build this network um, and demonstrate some of what we call the regenerative solutions um, to achieving uh, sustainable development, uh, regenerative development, uh, hopefully being the next phase of the global goals um, with the overarching um, goal of our network to demonstrate uh, solutions that leave no one behind or attempt to leave no one behind. Thank you, Lloyd. Um, my name is Irwan Rusli. I'm a um, Rusli Institute of Technology and Development. Uh, currently, I'm uh, trying to uh, gathering uh, potential pilot projects for the poverty alleviation all over the world. Uh, so we just would like to have the pilot program to, to show uh, some of the uh, comprehensive and uh, integrated uh, scenario for the poverty alleviation, including power uh, empowerment and including the health and uh, aspect of the empowerment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Risley. Hi. Hi. Yes, I am Madly. I am uh, from Martinique. And I am the, the founder of uh, Peace Innovation Ecosystem uh, with uh, arts, music, but um, also creativity in a broader sense, broader meaning. We are actually uh, empowering people to reconnect with themselves, others, and their bigger purpose for them to be able to be at their full potential. And of course, we uh, encourage them to, to embrace green conscious lifestyle, investing, entrepreneurship, and uh, healing. That's it. Thank you so much. That's it. You're on, Elsie. OK, thank you very much. Um, it's really good to be speaking to such a wide diverse diversity of people. And I hope that you all will find something interesting in my, what I have to share. And perhaps will share with me after any points that you have to make, which may make a contribution to maternal healthcare, well, right across the world, because I think we're all in the same 
or very similar boats for sure. Uh, my apologies, uh, Elsie, just to let you know, we're not, we're recording and we're live streaming on Facebook. So just want to let fine. you know. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Thank you. So I am a practicing midwife in the United Kingdom, but I'm also very focused on repairing the detriment. So that's the deaths and the damage to all mothers, but my focus, my main focus is on the people who have the worst outcomes, which are the folk in my community, African community, African Caribbean community, and indeed any other community that has the worst outcomes. So my, the title of my talk really is about considering the legacy for Africans and maternal health care inequalities. A very useful way of thinking about our work is really looking at Sankofa, which is about going back to fetch what is at risk in order to go forward. In other words, we have to understand what has happened in the past so that we get a really good understanding, a fundamental understanding of the issues so that we can actually positively and effectively go forward in our work. And what is at risk in this instance? It's really about what happens to our communities across the board. So I, um, I was born in, the, um, in Jamaica, in the Caribbean, brought up um, of mixed heritage. And my journey to becoming a midwife wasn't exactly very straightforward. First of all, I wanted to be a musician. Then I wanted to be a journalist. And then I decided to follow in the footsteps of my own mother, who, who was herself a nurse, trained in the UK, and then returned home to serve her people. In my case, I didn't actually return home to serve anybody. I was actually, um, I continued to work here. Having said that, I've traveled. I went back to the Caribbean for a spell, went to Africa for a spell, and then came back to the UK to live and to work. On my return, I found it, it, it was so very different and, and I really couldn't understand quite what was going on. So that set me off on a journey of discovery. It also set me off on a journey of receiving some really important gifts, some of which um, Prophet Cox has actually um, mentioned here. So um, eventually becoming um, an elder in the Global African Congress UK, and then working with the Permanent Forum Education and Outreach Committee as a scribe. So looking back, I mean, we have to kind of look back at the building of empire, which, which in, in essence is our backstory. So we, we see all those hundreds of years ago, how it was that the continent of Africa was invaded by Europeans of all hues, so the Portuguese, the English, the Spanish, and then the introduction of chattel slavery, which then created the transatlantic slave trade in the 1400s. So definitely thousands of people had been transported, enslaved and transported from the continent to the Caribbean, to America, and to other places, except that those places were not necessarily spoken about in, 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 in as much as, say, for example, the Caribbean and indeed America. Then we had colonization in the 1800s. And certainly in places like the Caribbean, when, once slavery had finished, because a lot of the slaves actually left the plantations, the English went then to places like China and to India, India primarily, to recruit what they described as indentured labor. So this is how it was in, in places like the Caribbean and certainly in Jamaica, we had different pe you know, people from all over the world 
really. Um, people were Europeans from all the European countries. We can identify quite a lot of um, people from India, places like Calcutta, where a host of people were brought as indentured labor to um, man the cane fields and others. And then people from China who were also brought over as indentured labor. So certainly in, in Jamaica, which is my homeland, we are, our motto is out of many, we are one people. So moving then back into England in particular, what had happened was that when the war had ended, the Second World War, those um, Jamaicans and others were invited back to England to build up the country. So there was quite a lot going on in terms of the new National Health Service, the railways, the underground, the buses, and other um, uh, businesses that needed to be built back up again. So a lot of people came from the Caribbean and certainly from Jamaica. Um, and the name Windrush actually um, is coming from one of the boats or one of the ships that brought people to England. And the Windrush is quite um, an important uh, milestone in terms of our history here in the United Kingdom. So then when it was that people began to get their independence from Britain, their, the, the Commonwealth nations were set up in, in, I think it was in the 1960s. So places like Jamaica, um, New Zealand, Australia, they actually became the Commonwealth nations and in fact, Bar Barbados has just stepped back now from being part of the Commonwealth, if I understand it rightly. They've now become a republic. So there is quite a lot of that going on in terms of people distancing or nations distancing themselves from um, being ruled by Britain or certainly having the Queen as their head of state. And then, of course, there are various people um, uh, immigrating to the United Kingdom from all over the world. So it, it's quite on places like London, uh, a seriously mixed um, population in London. You can find people from all over the world in London. And then in terms of people coming here to work, to live and to work, there's quite a lot of international recruitment, which actually started and certainly for uh, healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, midwives, physiotherapists, and all manner of healthcare workers um, being recruited, certainly in the 60s, and all the way through, and in fact, is going on as we speak just now. So what we see is that a lot of people have come to help to build up the nation, but not all are actually of the same, are being treated the same. In terms of those of us who identify as African and utilizing the African ways of caring, of health and well-being, what we have seen is that in Africa, on the continent, the knowledge and skills in terms of health and well-being, medicines, those things have developed over generations, were handed down through the families, and in actual fact, tended to use whole plants or parts of the plant. We have a huge diversity of plants on the continent. And in fact, a lack of the documentation um, is, you know, is, is very clear. And, and what we see in fact is that a lot of the remedies, the herbs, the plants are identified through family lines. So for example, uh, a child might accompany the grandmother when she goes to pick the herbs and that is the way she learns about the herbs. So there was very little documentation in terms of 
what, what plants there are and what, what the plants are used for. And in actual fact, if I think back to my own family, my great grandmother was, her, was a herbalist, but very sadly, by the time I came to realize that she had already passed over to the ancestors. So, you know, I, I don't have that information. That information did not come down the line, but I do know that that is the case because certainly when we went to visit her in the country, somebody would come back with, and I remember very clearly my dad coming back with a poultice for some issue on his leg. Our working on the continent was largely to do with prevention, plants, foods, were more to do with prevention, but also sometimes about you know, following a diagnosis, there was treatment. These plants, these remedies were easily accessible. So people didn't necessarily have to pay for them. And they were used to treat all manner of conditions. So physical, mental, but also spiritual issues that arose. And then, of course, there was talking therapies. And some of that actually, I think, still exists today, although it's not necessarily seen as something formal. So uh, certainly when I was in Africa, um, looking out my clinic window, I would often see people um, being out under the tree, talking, um, meeting with an elder to discuss an issue, and then coming away, you know, so sort of going in very serious looking and then coming away smiling. So I think some of the talking therapies, which are not necessarily formal, are still practiced today and are beneficial. And of course, we have cultural practices, rituals and dance, which form a large part of healing. So, for example, there is Certainly in Jamaica, something that I've been a part of is um, a kumina, which comes out of um, West Africa, which is used for celebration. So celebration of a death, New Year's. And in terms of it, um, it is a ritual. Um, it has a specific form which is followed. It includes singing, dancing, the sacrifice and the giving of tokens. The other really important thing, and certainly as far as maternity care is concerned, what we did have on the continent is continuity of care, which is really quite important in terms of understanding people as you work with them, but also the building of therapeutic caring relationships in order to benefit on certainly on both sides there's a learning an acknowledgement a trust which builds up when you have the continuity of carer so what has happened certainly across the board and certainly when we're talking about maternal and child health is how it is that the ways of the West, the introduction of how the West works in terms of policy and practice has distorted our, um, our, uh, the benefits that we gain from our original ways of working. So the hierarchical systems, which puts some people in power over some people, the broad, deep, wide, use of immunization and vaccination programs, which not necessarily a bad thing, but the coercion that comes alongside it is not necessarily helpful when people have to make an informed consent. And certainly for us as registrants in the United Kingdom, informed consent is paramount to our practice. Data collection is also something that is, it is necessary because otherwise, how would we know that a service is actually working, that it is benefiting, who is coming for the service and so on. But then data collection actually causes some issues in terms of abuse of the data, data collected without people's knowledge 
and consent. And then the harnessing and patenting of natural resources, which is a problem because what it does then is commercialize the, um, the resources and it is then not as easily available for all to use and it comes at cost. What we find then is that the introduction of these Western practices gives us this authoritative voice, which initially came via the church missionaries and white saviorism and white learners, which still impact today, certainly in maternity service here. And then we have the wars. I mean, we look at what's going on now in Ukraine and then the economic and environmental situation that are impacting large areas of the world now, not to um, dismiss the poverty that comes alongside that. Of course, we do know, and certainly there's a lot of information coming out of the US where various experiments have been performed on people of African descent, surgical techniques and instruments. So for example, um, the, there's Dr. Marlon Sims who developed quite a lot of his techniques and his instruments on the black body. Human tissue that was harvested without consent. And we think about Henrietta Lacks. And then the plagiarizing treatments, including immunization methods. And we do know that the immunization, well, the, the research tells us that the immunization methods actually started with someone from Af of African descent. And of course, all of this is to make money on the back of those people who are goaded into this way of working and way of receiving care. On the other hand, what we see then is that our medicines have been ridiculed, have been undermined, and the way of us looking at holistic way of living, of eating, working, and the way we work with disease and illness is ridiculed and in some instances are banned. So, and, and the thing is, it's so difficult to actually get rid of these things instinctively from people because certainly I, I know definitely living and working in the Caribbean, but also in Africa, and even here in the United Kingdom, people use their own home remedies first, in many cases, instinctively, before they actually go off to the uh, mainstream doctors for support. Quite often in, in my clinic in, in Africa, people would go to what they call the witch doctor. And when it was that that did not work is when they actually came to clinic to seek help and support. Of course, <laughs> there was no ridiculing on my part because I think it is really quite an important part of how people live their lives and how they manage their health and well-being. So really, really important from that perspective. So then we wonder really and truly, you know, why are we so suspicious? Why are we angry about these things that are going on? And, and certainly we've seen that in the COVID pandemic, you know, a lot of people have been resistant, have been angry. A lot of us have not taken the COVID immunizations or the COVID treatments because we're not sure for one reason or another why or whether we should have these uh, treatments. And actually, it seems that we have forgotten about how it is, or we very easy to forget how it is that we can work with our bodies in all the aspects, so physically, mentally, emotionally, socially, and spiritually. Spirituality is certainly in the African community is very a very, very important part. So coming back into now the NHS in, in, in England and the health service in England, part of our backdrop is the hostile environment that we find ourselves. 
We also find it very difficult to be heard when things are needed, when things are going wrong. We have issues with the employer in terms of how structures, you know, it's very hierarchical way of working inside the NHS, inside health services altogether, even in the private sector. And then now my visit, so part of my work is helping people to come on board to be midwives so we can grow the midwifery um, workforce. But the issues within the midwifery workforce were such that we, we didn't seem to be growing numbers. People would come, people would start to train, and then they would leave. So it was really about helping people to understand what it was to be a midwife. So I would take them to our regulator, the NMC, the Nursing and Midwifery Council, so that they would understand what it is, how it is to be a midwife, but also how it is when you fall off the peg of being a midwife, you know, what happens? How does the regulator treat you? We're having a lot of problems now in terms of understanding what's going on for maternity services. Why is it that black women are dying at four to five times greater than their white counterparts? Why are our women, our babies dying at 50% more than others. The media has a lot to say about that at the moment, but also in terms of the parliament, there's quite a lot of um, inquiries. And in actual fact, next, next Monday, a group of us are going to parliament to have a discussion around these issues for black mothers and babies. We also have a number of professional international organizations of, for example, the International Confederation of Midwives who work right across the world to support good practice. And then of course, the, um, the UN Durban Declaration and the Program of Action talked about the fact that the transatlantic enslavement was a crime against humanity and that we should actually be looking towards working with our governments and the NGOs to ameliorate that. So what you see here is myself. I was part of the contingent who went to the um, UN in Geneva to respond to the governmental statement around the people in the United Kingdom, what's going on for people in the United Kingdom. I was very fortunate to have had a little time to share what was going on for uh, black mothers and babies in the United Kingdom as part of the decade. I've also been supporting the academics. I'm not an academic myself but I've been supporting the uh, experts, the, the academics experts in terms of working to raise these issues. And also locally in the United Kingdom with other groups that are working towards the improvement of services. So then what I have found is that looking right across the board, very broadly and also very deeply, for people of African descent, we seem to be from the point of conception to the point of our death, whenever that happens, we are disadvantaged. In actual fact, I would say that in terms of the first thousand and one days of the human life, we are blighted on the vine, so to speak. So the first 1,001 days are really about setting the benchmark for human, for, for human life. So that period of time actually um, says, you know, the, 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 the prospects for this human being having been grown well inside the mom, being birthed well, through the vagina, getting its first inoculation of um, the, the microbiome, then being skin to skin with its mother, and then being breastfed 
for at least the first six months and being really well nurtured well um, this sets the, the the life course for someone so what we see then is that in the United Kingdom we have we, we are very fortunate to have every every year looking back for the previous three years what has gone on for women you know the, we look at the confident it's a confidential inquiry into the deaths in the United Kingdom and what we see certainly this is the one from 2016 what we see is that black women have the highest rate of death um, mixed race women um, next in line Asian women and so on down but for me what I would say is that there are some black people who would describe themselves as mixed race. So I would say that the rates are actually a lot higher. I mean, and I'm not an academic, but just common sense would tell me that the rates would be much higher if you actually combine the two together. So what, what I believe very strongly is that the integration of Western medicine um, does not meet our needs and our values. And it actually impacts on maternity care to our detriment. It was highlighted a lot um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. The stillbirths actually rose, we found that. The perinatal mortality rose. Women were fearful, they felt traumatized, a lot of them, because of how the service had to be reconfigured or indeed were reconfigured, a lot of women felt neglected, coerced into induction. Induction rates went up astronomically. And then what we found was that there was a rise in the number of women who were birthing by themselves without any medical support whatsoever. So, when we look at the, the, the situation of where we sit in the outcomes, the impact on outcomes is that black women would sit right at the base. You know, they would have had the worst of all these um, issues described here. For me though, what I've come to realize is that that's the one thing, but damage is quite something else. So it might be less, uh, less visible, but it's like underlying and it, go, it's, it goes on for a much longer time and actually impacting the whole of the life course. So for example, babies wouldn't be nurtured very well. Women have had a lot of mental health issues. And in fact, they, there is research that shows that babies who are born to women who were depressed themselves become depressed or have mental health issues when they hit their teens and ongoing. Their education abilities are affected and so it goes on right through their economic problem uh, prospects, family life and the village communities in terms of how we are living now or having to live in European situation is that we're more isolated. We don't any longer live in village communities to support each other. Uh, and, and you know the, the impact of that on our society altogether. So the current solutions, because at the end of the day, these, um, these issues have been known for a very long time. There's a lot of research being done, and there is actually a lot of research Lots of people are getting masters and PhDs and ongoing work, a lot of funding going out, not so much to people of African descent. And, and that is actually been shown. A lot of people are using our information in order to help themselves. Sometimes they're helping us, but a lot of the time to help themselves, you know, elevate themselves in terms of their career progression and so on. But certainly as midwives and a group of us that have got together, we have been looking very carefully at how it is that we can support our communities. So in the UK, we have local maternity systems, 
which is the LMS. We have the NHS E, which is National Health Service England, but we also have a policy known as Better Birth. So Better Birth is the extant maternity policy. It took a very lot, like a couple of years, two or three years to actually be formulated. And it is based on a wide um, review, investigation, audit, right across England. And then a solution or, or various um, solutions were suggested or put forward. One of which is the continuity of carer model. This, this is a model that we believe has to be the best workable because it, it helps to meet our needs and values as individual. And that is also, if we think about birth, birth is a physical, it's an emotional, it's a spiritual, and it is only in this way that we can actually manage to fulfill these needs and values in order that we can birth to the best of our ability and thereby remove some of this long lasting damage and God forbid, any deaths. So really it's about going back, fetching what is at risk in order to go forward. So in terms of our future then, we've done a lot of research and development, there is still more to go. We're looking at reverse commissioning. So reverse commissioning being working with the providers, working with the commissioners of NHS maternity care to develop the culturally safe models, to involve people from our community as well as others so that we can actually look at the issues. So for example, you have to understand what racism is about, systems of oppression, so that we can actually work through them and then add on the training in terms of good healthcare, good midwifery care and support people to actually work well within those systems. Definitely, because birth is a physiological process. It's about public health. It's about prevention. It's also about health promotion. And we are definitely focused on African-centered therapeutic models. So for example, um, uh, African psychology, a lot of which has actually, um, <laughs> I have to say, has come out of the United States of America. There's, you know, there, there is, I, I am, really proud to listen to some of the theories, some of the workings that has gone on in the States, which we have very little of here, but it is being shared at the moment. So we are actually able to develop things that would suit us. And then we also have to learn based in history, based in the Sankofa model, how it is that we protect ourselves against being exploited so that we can actually use research and data to our benefit. So this is myself and my colleague, Yvonne White. We have over the number of years taken time to use the gifts that we were given to develop a model of care, which we are putting to the commissioners now so that we can actually begin the work of repairing some of the deaths, some of the damage that's been in, in our community. And the picture on the side where it says clinical practice is the model. So we have a holistic model. It's based in community space and it delivers what we would call culturally safe care. We have all the issues of governance that are important in the UK embedded into this and all what we have to do now is to work it to be commissioned to work it and then evaluate it so that we can actually roll it out as a small it's a small midwifery practice 
So midwives, I know there's not a lot of midwives in the States and there are some countries that do not utilize midwives, they use nurses. But in the UK, we are really fortunate to have at least um, a framework for midwifery, although it is <laughs> suffering a little bit at the moment, in fact, suffering a lot at the moment, but we have a good framework and UK midwifery is recognized and valued across the world. So we are a profession of what body of knowledge. We utilize skills, we utilize knowledge right across other professions, science, sociology, technology, and we are autonomous clinicians. We are able to develop therapeutic relationships with our clients, with our patients. And in actual fact, they will be clients rather than patients because most women giving birth or being pregnant are well people. We practice in the home, in the community, in hospitals, clinics, or health units. And we in the UK are able on our own cognizance to give full care before pregnancy, during pregnancy, labor, birth, and the postnatally up to about 28 days on our own cognizance without, as long as everything is straightforward, without referring to anybody else for that sort of care. But we are linked into, we're not um, uh, solo practitioners, we are linked into the system. So we liaise with the family practitioner who after all is going to be looking after the family, the baby and the family and the mom. We linked into the health visitor, which would be the public health nurse and anybody else that is um, important for the, for the woman and her family. However, we refer, we have referral rights of referral. We are entitled to refer to any other medical or other practitioner as appropriate. So for example, if we had a woman with um, problems with her pelvis, we might refer her to a physiotherapist or indeed if she had a, an infection, then clearly her general practitioner would be able to um, support with treatment. We do have our own drugs for, for use, but and some of us are actually trained to be prescribers, but in general, um, midwives do not have to be um, prescribers of medicine. So we would then utilize a general practitioner. So you might ask, what is this thing about cultural safety? So cultural safety is a concept that I met when I was looking at whether I should go and work in New Zealand or not. And for me, it is so important to have somebody who is non-racist or indeed culturally safe. And I, I, I like the term culturally safe, cultural safety simply because it is a much kinder, it, it, it doesn't cause people to become angry or defensive, but it actually is about the same thing. And it's really about understanding the issues of power, the fact that there is a disparity in terms of who holds the power. So a clinician will hold the power over a client, a woman, and the organization also has the hierarchical power structure. It also applies, well, it applies to individuals, but it also can apply to organizations. So what then happens with cultural safe practices is that the patient has the power or the family has the power. It recognizes that transfer of power needs to go from the provider to the patient so that they will be able to make a choice about what they find safe to use. So if you look at the second section, it says it contends that people are so diverse that teaching simple ritual and custom stereotypes and rigidifies, 
rigidifies ideas of culture and does not allow for human diversity. And what some of the trainings or the, the unconscious bias trainings, et cetera, talk about is that we need to learn about other people's culture. Well, it is impossible to learn about everybody's culture, but it's far more important to understand how it is that you are in terms of your biases and the fact that you have a position, a privileged position over the patient or the client and to enforce your ideas or your thoughts might actually be harmful to that person. So just looking again at some other thoughts around cultural safety, it came out of the experience of colonization and it recognizes that the social, historical, political and economic diversity of a culture impacts on the, their contemporary health experience. It actually came out of a Maori nurse who is, is listed at the bottom, Irihapiti Ramsden in 2002. What she found was that even then, when the Maori were having the same, the same care as the European New Zealanders, the Maori were actually having the worst outcomes. So she actually spent a lot of time to develop this concept and it is now embedded into education, nursing education, and is rolled out across the health service. Looking again at the Sankofa issue, I was really privileged to be in New York, I think it was in 2017. And two things that I wanted to do, I wanted to go to the beach with my girlfriend, but also to visit the United Nations, to look at the arc of return, to, to sit and to ponder and to think and to do what they ask the visitors to do, to consider the tragedy, to acknowledge it, look at the legacy and consider how it is that we could actually use these thoughts to improve the lives of all, in particular those of African descent. And just to end, His Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie 1963 to the UN, as part of his speech, basically what he was saying is, we must look into ourselves, into the depths of our souls. We must become something we have never been and for which our education and experience and environment have ill prepared us. We must become bigger than we have been, more courageous, greater in spirit, larger in outlook. We must become members of a new race, overcoming petty justice, prejudice, owing our ultimate allegiance, not to nations, but to our fellow men within the human community. And he was a black man, but also from a white man, Rudolf Steiner, who people, there are people who would say he was racist. However, he had this to say, fear of a thing, prevents us from seeing it properly. Racial prejudice prevents us from seeing into the human soul. So I'll just end to point out that most of these sources here are actually from the U US and okay, actually have a long way to go in terms of developing our, um, our resources to support. So thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Gail. Uh, Elsie, this is, that was wonderful. And so we're open for questions. At some point, I'm gonna to switch to my phone because I need to go get my grandson, but we have some time. Questions, comments, thoughts. I see a hand up, Dr. Woosley, go ahead. 
Yes, um, it's very interesting talk, and I'm interested about the effect of poverty, especially in the r- rural area, remote area, um, where midwife maybe not not that many. So it's very rare, for example. Uh, what do you think about the use, for example, telemedicine, where we can empower these uh, expecting mothers, maybe through information, um, through um, education on how to properly have a healthy pregnancy, for example, uh, through this uh, e-learning, for example. Uh, and at the same time, uh, can we even do the having the birth um, possible in case midwife not available? Uh, is it possible to provide practice or training to um, women, maybe locally, so that they are able to do that in case uh, some urgent uh, situation occur, or maybe in collaboration with the education with midwife, midwife in the city, for example, and this this uh, trained nurse, assistant nurse in the village. Uh, would you comment on that one, please? Yes, of course. So thank you very much for that question. I think it is so relevant, <laughs> even in the UK and the US, where services are um, a challenge, let me say. I think it's really, first of all, important to recognize that birth, childbirth, is a physiological process in the main. Yes, we have instances where women are becoming pregnant who have medical and other needs, but in the main, it is a physiological process. And undisturbed would tend to resolve without many issues. Poverty, yes, brings malnutrition and malnutrition definitely will impact the childbearing continuum for sure. What has been happening in many countries is that traditional birth attendants are being trained and supported to deliver care, certainly in the rural outlying areas where there is very little um, uh, medical assistance to hand. What also happens is that medical assist, uh, medical uh, people are asked to come into the city when they are about due. But definitely a lot of e-learning can take place and certainly in the pandemic, uh, part of the solution for a number of women, and I, in fact, have done a Zoom booking, a card of the blood pressure and a card of the palpation and test the urine online. But definitely we can do booking. We can have conversation. We can have education online. So that, 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 that can take that box if indeed those resources are available. So the phone, um, the signal and so on is available. It is not difficult to train people who are keen, who are willing, who are interested and passionate about supporting mothers to birth. And there are countries which are doing just that and equipping the, the, the lay midwife. So for example, or the traditional birth attendant with a kit or kits to help them to achieve that safely and to help them to understand when help is needed for the mother and then transport to get the person into the city or to the town where more advanced help is required. So that is entirely possible. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I was wondering another thing, if, if I may, what about the, the two, uh, 1,000 uh, days? Uh, so that's including the two years of the baby after they were born. Yes. Uh, yes. Is that a follow-up that you would feel like uh, very critical in terms of 
brain development in terms of uh, cognitive or any anything that uh, very critical at that point uh, would it be something and also i was wondering about the mortality of the baby uh, statistically thank you Okay, so the, the first 1001 days, certainly that has been a project here. It started in Parliament uh, and it was supported by uh, uh, an NGO. So the first 1001 days are recognized as the most significant time in a human being's life to set the life course. So a baby who is grown well in a mother who is birthed vaginally, they kickstart the, the, the first part of the immune system. They're skin to skin with the mother for at least an hour after birth or as long as possible. And then breastfed for the first six months. These are the people that actually have the strongest immune system. And then leading from there, it's in terms of being nurtured, and supported and um, having the checks, you know, um, eyes, teeth, and so on. So these are the things that actually kickstart or rec certainly recognize to kickstart um, the, the best um, long-term for, for, for a human being, whoever this person happens to be really. So, yeah. Prince Andrew had a question. Were you, oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Rusi, did you have another follow-up or? Oh uh, yeah, about the death of the baby. Uh, is that statistically uh, similar in the sense that uh, more uh, in the rural or in the African well, community? Well, what we have in the UK is the statistics that have been collected by um, the University of Oxford, actually. They have a, a particular, you, you can go online and have a look. It's called the Embrace, M-B-R-R-A-C-E. And it's a confidential inquiry into maternal deaths, but it also does confidential inquiry into the perinatal situation for babies as well. Um, and it's been ongoing for many, many years now. It's done every year, but a three year, you know, it looks at the previous three years. So if the, the, the last iteration for babies was the 50%, where all babies are 50% 50, 50 more likely to die a stillbirth. Thank you. All of those, all of, you can actually go on the website and have a look at all of those figures. Thank you. And Dr. Rusley, I just really quick, Prince Andrew, that because I um, attend a meeting at least last year uh, every month for it's called KBAN Kansas Birth Equity Network because we have a county in Kansas that has some of the highest infant mortality rates in the nation, and uh, in our case, we don't have so many that are rural, but we are finding that women, no matter what their economic status, no matter what their education their rate of infant mortality, mother and child um, being at risk or death or, is higher than even a white mother who just barely has a GED. So in our case, uh, they're finding the social determinants of, of uh, health, um, they've been proven through. And so, you know, I could, if you were interested in that, in terms of this country, I could get some of that data to you. I can't give off the numbers like Elsie does. She has them on tip of her tongue. <laughs> but, okay. but we, but we do, so it is a global issue. And so let's have uh, Prince Andrew go ahead with your question. Well, thank you so much. <clears throat> and first of all, thank you so much for your presentation. I think it's critically important. And I know you did acknowledge the fact that we are recording this and live streaming it, but I would like your permission to uh, extract your presentation as a separate presentation that we can distribute on a wider area if that's something uh, that you would be agreeable to, of course. We would include credits and references to you and your website. I would like to ask to make sure in the chat that you do provide us with information about how to reach you personally and on your web on the website information as well. Uh, I'm going to digress just a moment. <clears throat> you mentioned earlier that the UK or that your research found a lot of information from here in the United States. I do want to briefly share my screen. Uh, with a, 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 a small digression, because here in the United States, for example, uh, Prince's <clears throat> Prophet Cox began this with an introduction of the Sustainable Development Goals. 
Mm-hmm. And this is, a, as you know, a global effort on behalf of most countries in the world to address these issues. But it's not just the sustainable development goals that happen out of the clear blue sky. Uh, this was actually founded, as you know, in 2015. But this is the second iteration was of what's called the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, this was formed not long after the Durban Declaration. And as you may know, the original intent was to address the crushing debt that African countries and others were undergoing from international <clears throat> agencies. But unfortunately, there was political uh, upheavals that prevented that from going forward, primarily because of vetoes by the US and Israel. However, the point is that here in the United States, we are in fact failing to achieve any of the 17 sustainable development goals and at least 50% of the of the states here in the United States. Uh, I'm a strong advocate of what's called the United Nations Global Compact. Uh, that was founded by Kofi Annan uh, when he was general secretary in 2000, alongside the United Nations uh, Millennium Development Goals. So two points, I'm gonna briefly share my screen here, if I may, just a moment. And we saw your hand, Carlos, as soon as uh, Prince Andrew wraps up then. And I too, uh, Prophet Cox wants to give, want to give acknowledgement to the way we met, which is through the Friends of the African uh, Union uh, and Herschel Daniels. Just to let you know, my own involvement with this effort was, it's kind of small to read at the bottom, but it reads the Kwanzaa Accord 2020 and the Sankofa Renaissance 2063. Uh, the Friends of the African, Un- African Union was the second organization that validated and endorsed this campaign after the Congress of African People, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, by Wesley Kabaila back in 2012. However, it was on December the 16th of 2012 uh, that I was appointed as a co-director of the FAU Bermuda Americas Bureau, along with Corin Smith. He's from the country of Bermuda. And I think it's critically important that we acknowledge the fact that we are all still overcoming the trauma that all Africans around the world and people of African descent have experienced as a result of what's called the Middle Passage. And it is, in fact, Bermuda that's the closest landmass to where that occurred. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm very privileged to have visited Bermuda in 2012 and I'll coordinate with Corn Smith the development of what we call the Kwanzaa Accord and the Sankofa Renaissance. Uh, specifically, the idea was to align the seven principles of Kwanzaa, not just for seven days a week at the end of one year, but to actually make a commitment to uphold these seven principles, seven cycles of seven years of seven days a week so that we embed these universal principles that are not limited to Africa, although they were inspired by Africa. But the idea is that we could in fact then begin to align the work that we're doing in the diaspora with that of the African Union Agenda 2063. I was just notified last week by my daughter in South Africa, Princess Seppi, that um, the CARICOM, which is the Caribbean community, mm-hmm. had actually made a trip to Gauteng, which is the cradle of humankind, to establish diplomatic relationships so that we can align our efforts around the world to support the work that you yourself are doing, doctor, to be able to bring this into a global conversation so that we can align our efforts in specific outcomes. Now, we're unfortunately talking about the decade of action to deliver the sustainable development goals, and we're only eight years away. But obviously our children sometimes believe that it's right here, right now, that we need to address issues and problems because the children are not our future, they're our present. So in that regard, after this call, I'd like to connect with you 
and find ways we can adapt your efforts with an ongoing project by the United Nations Global Compact for 2021 through 2023. That overlaps with the first 10 year implementation plan of the African Union's Agenda 2063. So the more we can allow and encourage our African diaspora to understand that these so-called United Nations goals are not something foreign from them, but embedded in the common African position on the post-millennium development goals that was actually enacted before the launch of the sustainable development goals. These seem to be esoteric and academic matters, but I'm believing that the more we can talk and convince our children that they're part of the narrative, the better able we will be able to get them to assist in accomplishing the objectives that we have in mind. So um, I just wanted to let you know that I'm fully committed to this. This is not an overnight commitment, but it's a lifelong commitment. So I just want to thank you and let you know I'm here to fully support your efforts. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, Prince Andrew. And so if uh, Carlos, did you still have a question or? Yeah, hello. Uh, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. And introduce yourself. Uh, hello? Yes, introduce yes. yourself, please. Uh -huh. Yes, uh, my name is Carlos Richard Sanko. I am the the president for Unity Net Africa and Astra, and also a co uh, founder, the Global Unity Network International, based in Canada. And I am also the CEO for Focus on Rural Development in Sierra Leone, which is a non governmental organization. I want to thank you so much for your time and and the professional presentation you just uh, completed. This is really, really amazing. As Andrew or as we are saying, uh, I was really, really curious and still curious at this time, how we can best coordinate our efforts, uh, the challenges to provide solutions to the challenges around the issue of healthcare system. Because as you are presenting, I, rem uh, uh, I reminded myself while I was um, a supervisor uh, supervising uh, the healthcare system in Sierra Leone uh, through uh, Kia International in the area of infant mortality, uh, mother mortality. And I know today in Sierra Leone and of course in Africa, mo most of the countries, uh, we are facing a lot of these challenges here you've just presented. So I was thinking this cannot happen in the UK uh, with the, the type of uh, medical system we have there and the level of awareness and whatever infrastructure uh, we know that UK has, uh, if we still have this serious problem of uh, abuses, for mm -hmm. instance, what you mentioned uh, in UK, of course, and uh, uh, Prophet Cox just also mentioned in US. And so I wonder what will happen what is the current situation in Africa? And we all know that Africa is the worst. So therefore, we as leaders, we are here. So as Andrew said, this is a long-term war that all mm -hmm. of us should come together and ensure that we, it, it, it comes to the past. And what Andrew mentioned is very, very important to start involving our children right from school level let's start to raise awareness at that level mm. to involve them mm. in the process is very very key and for me uh, as at organizational level i'm really really proud of our, int uh, our interventions we are going direct at community level 
And at community level, we target the children. We target mm -hmm. young people. They are, the problem is, they are the mismatch is. So therefore, if uh, I was asking if your, your UK Midwifery Association has any component or connection in Africa, if it is there, how can we work together to ensure that we bring all this to synopsize, to support the process and minimize the problems, the challenges we are facing, especially Africa, as you are African descent, what you can do to ensure that you, you contribute towards the African healthcare situation now to turn it around, including ourselves, African residents. Thank you. I uh, thank you very much for that um, comment, suggestions, Brother Sanko. Um, to be honest, <laughs> the solution is really, really simple. Honestly, we give it to the women. Women in the main are passionate about having good birth, bearing children well, loving them and nurturing them, they are incentivized in the best possible way. Women who are sisters, mothers, grandmothers, friends, nieces, aunts, and so on, they will also be very keen to support that process. And the work of the midwife is very simple. It is about prevention. It is about a lot of common sense, knowledge and skills, and a lot of it, which is actually already based in our community if we haven't lost it already. And it's really about ministries of health working in ways that support people to learn, develop skills, provide them with resources, so that in small ways, we can actually begin the work. Our little um, midwifery, we, we call ourselves Mimosa Midwives. We are battling to get commissioned because the, you know, I personally, at the moment, in order to keep my registration going, I'm working for a private midwifery company where women have to pay thousands to be cared for. That said, we do a lot of pro bono work in our own community, but the way things are set up, we are restricted. So what we are doing now is to trying to be commissioned in order to deliver first class care in a very simple way in the community, working with all the things you've talked about. So for example, health education, um, helping women to feel good about themselves so that they, empower themselves with knowledge, they support their and nurture their children and so on. I mean, these are the things, these are the basis of family life really and truly. And even when people are poor, there are ways of supporting families. So people, I mean, certainly in the pandemic, a lot of people were planting foods, uh, vegetables, fruit. You know, th there are things we can do to actually support good family life. And if the government then, so ministries of health or whatever, support that, you know, I'm sure things will improve. It is a very simple thing to do in terms of um, supporting training for people who are interested so that women will be supported to actually begin life in a positive way that makes a benefit. So in answer to your um, question, we, we don't have any, um, we're a small group of five midwives and 20 other people who want to come on board to be commissioned to deliver this service in our locality, where we have in certain, in, in our part of the world, some of the worst outcomes, really. But we are willing, and, and, and I dare say, we have connections with midwives in the US one, one in particular, a midwife called Jenny Joseph, who operates out of Florida. She is your benchmark in, in, in the US. 
And I dare say there are people in the continent or on the continent of Africa who are doing similar things. So we should be able to network and to support each other to those things. And certainly through the International Confederation of Midwives, which is a worldwide organization for promoting midwifery, we should be able to achieve some of that, I am sure. Uh, if I may, uh, thank, thank you, you so much for that reply. And Carlos <clears throat> and Doctor, I do want to let you know that the own my own initiative, I began as the president of Five Points Youth Foundation when, in 2014 uh, upon my election to actually join the United Nations Global Compact. What I want you to know is that there are 13,000 major multinational corporations that are members. It's the largest corporate social responsibility organization in the world. They publish annually what their commitments are and what they're committed to do. However, there are only 3,000 civil society members. That includes nonprofit organizations, associations, labor or labor organizations, business associations like Chambers of Commerce, but also educational institutions of higher learning and education. And so <clears throat> the role that we are willing to undertake is to add another 10,000 members to that organization of civil society to balance and hold accountable those major multinational corporations and, and governments. So I speak that to you specifically because uh, Carlos and Doctor, the minute that we can begin to register all of these individual members of this midwifery association in the United States, the UK, Africa, then we stand to have a greater chance of having a voice at the table. Uh, thanks to the Shola Akbula Goodwill Ambassador Association in Nigeria, on June 23rd of 2020, they launched an online platform so that we are not just registering people to have greenwashing and say, oh, we got a lot of numbers, but to hold accountable and be transparent, which is one of the principles of the United Nations Global Compact. So the idea is to have a pre-screening process where we can identify projects that have been successfully commit, co completed, identify the people that are actually doing it. But looking forward, um, the idea that Lloyd and I and others of our Ayakba team came up with in 2019 was to focus on delivering commercial solutions that could support our humanitarian causes and not the other way around. Mm. So in that regard, we have put in place a corporate infrastructure that will provide liability insurance worldwide to our efforts, but it does also require us identifying who is involved because 75% of decisions are made based on the management team. So it would be critically important to identify what skill set we have at the table and who we have to step forward. Someone who is not here now that Lloyd well knows is Joan Kerr. Joan, Joan Kerr is in a position to be able to provide, I hope, the fiscal oversight so that our financial endeavors cannot just be transparent, but also aligned and compliant with the corporate structures involved. So Irwin's own activities to address poverty and these issues are very relevant to outcomes, but it's only when we ourselves take a book out of the Sankofa uh, message and reach, fetch, reach back to fetch what we left behind so that we can all go forward together in an Ubuntu outcome for us that we can accomplish these objectives. So again, I'd like to follow up with each of you after this and the prophet to map out a way ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brother Andrew. That sounds really exciting. Thank you. Thank yeah, you for the uh, presentation. Go ahead, Dr. Rusley. Yeah, I agree completely with Andrew. Let us uh, put uh, ourselves together in terms of uh, uh, working together. Uh, I'm uh, looking forward also with Dr. Elsie uh, Gill, and then um, we we see what we can uh, put um, for Africa, for example, and focus there and what we can contribute. Thank you. 
Thank you as well. And keep in mind that with the I Am Amari project as well, that uh, Elsie Gale will be part of the advisory uh, board so that her activities, along with what you mentioned today, will also be working with those five countries that we work with women and girls around um, from, but we actually have in the plan from a womb to tomb, Elsie. <laughs> And that's really because the learning begins in the womb, the health begins in the womb, and actually the health of the mother prior to getting pregnant also mm -hmm. counts. So mm -hmm. it's a very critical chain to, uh, to ensure that it's not broken. Thank you so much. Well, I do want to say also that just as she mentioned that the, the solution is simple by involving women and putting them at the forefront of it, of course, today we're addressing sustainable development goal number three, good health and well-being. But of course, number five, gender equality and empowerment is critically mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. We have a major failing, not for a lack of people doing work that impacts the sustainable development goals. We have a lack of awareness of the people that are doing it, that they're doing it in alignment with the sustainable development goals. So a lot of our out outcomes can be accelerated just by educating the general public particularly those in our own networks, about how what we're doing impacts one or more of the sustainable development goals that we can begin to deliver the data that's so critical for larger corporations and governments to not just take notice of us, but to allow us to integrate our efforts with theirs. At the end of the day, it's data that counts, and we have to have evidence-based results. The great news is that we have it. The, the greater news is that we can now deliver it. Thank you. Absolutely. And so that's the other piece, I think, a key word that you mentioned is integrative, because the uh, some of what uh, Elsie mentioned today, even the uh, black psychology that comes out of the U.S. that that uh, uh, are also a part of the um, advisory board, she knows about them in UK. They're also in Zimbabwe around the whole um, uh, issues that happen because of the African Mayafa, the African Holocaust, that all these things tie together. So uh, we're grateful for our presentation today. We want you to keep in mind the words integrative, comprehensive, inclusive, because it is a conclusive mo inclusive model that we're all working for. And uh, as she mentioned, she's on the permanent forum for people on people of African descent, which brings together 1.6 billion people of African descent to finally get solutions, not to isolate or to exclude anyone else, but they call it equity. Equity is different than equality. Equity mm -hmm. means if you're six foot tall and I'm four foot five, that I get a stool to stand on. So I need something extra to be able to be equal. And so that's what we're talking about is equity, not exclusion of anyone else, but the focus being highly um, culturally relevant for particular populations and then being able to enrich others who interact with those populations so that they won't have missteps along the way based on their prior understanding of who people are of African descent. So that's, that's all a part of it. And so that was the purpose for inviting her. There'll be others as well that will be coming who also are from the Association of Black Psychologists who have done the research and scholarship as well as other sectors who, um, other healthcare workers, others in sort of a social um, engaged with community. So there are a lot of pieces to the puzzle. So we're grateful to, for you today, Elsie, but Elsie comes as a package, I know well enough to know, that she also does essential oils, which I love. So all these, <laughs> as you well know, all these people, pieces work together. So just keep in mind sort of that it's, it's an African-centered model, that it is very holistic and that there are many pieces that are connected and that's what we're bringing to the table. Thank you everyone for coming and for being a part of this. And we look forward to other sessions and this particular Unity um, Health Network will be seeking to bring the pieces that are not as well known, or like you said, Prince Andrew, that main people may not be aware of, but keep in mind as they come, they are connected. They're not, they don't kind of dangle out there. They're part of many different systems. I think Elsie says she just came from, um, was it acupuncture class? Yes, yeah, well, no, ac acupuncture itself, really, yeah. I okay, have, okay. <laughs> regular acupuncture, yeah, once a month acupuncture. Yeah, yes, really yes. important. Yeah. Yes, all these things that they work together. The, um, like I said, some of the herbal treatments, I like the history that you shared, all these things. So one of the big things was to be able to bring traditional complementary 
alternative and integrative medicine together and have it be uh, uh, accepted and equi equitably so that it can take its rightful place. And so you really hit a lot of areas that we've kind of touched on in some of these forums and meetings that uh, I thought was excellent. So thank you everyone for coming. I know that Prince Andrew made sure that it was um, uh, uh, live stream. So it is on Facebook and he'll be working on the, on the uh, recording. And I see Modley put a message and they're saying thank you. And um, so thank you everyone for coming. I know thank everyone you. has a busy day. Uh -huh. Okay, oh, I'm headed, go ahead. Oh, I'm gonna stop sharing and those that do have a video or would like to share their video, we normally give a wave to everyone before we leave. So if you'd like, now is that time. We can, in fact, allow the audience to see who's actually here. But I'll leave that up to your own discretion. Ball's in your court. Yeah, I kind of need to sign off because I'm late. I was going to use my phone, but my, my system shut down. So I need to go get my grandson. So everybody, if you turn your, I can't turn mine on because I still have a broke camera. So just wait. Can you, uh, Prince Andrew, can you give a wave for me? You or Elsie, can someone wave for me? Yeah. That's my way. Yeah, wave both hands for me until I can get my camera fixed. Thank you, everybody. Dr. Rusling, everybody that's here. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. All right. Bye-bye. We're going to end it. Love to all. Bye-bye.